Welcome to those of you who are on Zoom. Thanks for tuning in as well, making this a wonderful uh, gathering time. I'm just gonna turn it over to Julie and um, we'll go. Good morning. Thanks for being here. Um, if you would indulge me with prayer. This is a John Philip Newell prayer. To the home of peace, to the field of love, to the land where forgiveness and right relationship meet, we look, O oh God, with longing for Earth's children, with compassion for the creatures, with hearts breaking for the nations and people we love. Open us to visions we have never known. Strengthen us for self-givings we have never made. Delight us with a oneness we could never have imagined, that we may truly be born of you, makers of peace. So, Think about a pilgrimage. I know some of you here have been on significant pilgrimages. Um, it's it's um, a time apart. You're leaving behind the distractions of your everyday life. You're leaving behind, no, not you. <laughs> you're, you're leaving behind um, the the daily life, and you're going in search of something, some new insight, some new place, maybe a new beginning. One of my favorite teachers from Ghost Ranch, Rabbi uh, Nahum Ward Lev, says this. In the prophetic worldview, God supports falling forward, mistake ridden, risk-taking, and boundary-crossing for the sake of growth and consciousness and relationship. So, I went on a civil rights pilgrimage. I was inspired to go by my friend, um, Diana Kaysen, who talked to me last spring in May. We sat together and had dinner, and she told me how profoundly impacted she was by a visit to Alabama. She went with a group of people with the United Methodist, Methodist Church, and then she took her daughter back. And when she took her daughter back, she believed then it was hers to do to get as many people as she could to go and to experience what she experienced. And when your friend looks at you and says that to you, what do you do? You lace up your shoes, right? You go. And that's what I did, I went. So I need to tell you, first of all, what I'm not. I am not a person with enormous knowledge and extensive experience in the civil rights movement. I am not that person. What I would like to do is to share what I experienced with you. My, I would like to share with you some of the history I learned. I would like for you to see images um, that I saw and then I'd particularly like you to hear the testimonies of some of the people that I heard. I hope I can do that justice. Um, and then what I would really love is if you would join Diana and me as lifetime learners. Um, because I think that's what, what we need is to continue to learn about this. I'm sharing a resource guide with you that was provided to me. If, if you want an email uh, with this information, Randy has a little tablet. If I send you the email, um, it'll have the hyperlinks in it. But particularly, if, if, you, if you just do two things for me, um, if you have access to see the movie Just Mercy or read the book, or if you see the film Selma, um, I think if you do those things, you'll be spurred on your own uh, exploration. So I'm coming at this as a white person 
And I'm trying to reckon with what that means to be privileged because I'm white. The encounters I had made me acutely aware that I have been complacent in my understanding of a system that has inflicted deep trauma, a system in our country that's harmed millions of people, a system that has yet to be fully eradicated. I can't nearly tell you everything I did, and if I start droning, one of you has to raise your hand, right? Because I can't see people's eyes glaze that way. Um, I'd just like to sketch out some of what I did um, and then maybe in particular spend a little time on the National Memorial for Peace and Justice and the Legacy Museum. Our group of 13 pilgrims were brought together through the North Carolina Institute for Spiritual Direction and Formation. The leaders were Clara Esther, you're gonna see a picture of Clara, the chair of the National Association of Deaconesses of the United Methodist Church, and a social welfare and civil rights activist. Clara Cox Woodleaf is a spiritual director and retreat leader, and then my friend Diana, who um, identifies as an organizer, an initiator, and strategic connector. I love that. We met in Birmingham, so there you go. Set out for the 16th Street Baptist Church, the site of a bombing that killed four young girls on September 15, 1963. This church, with a predominantly black congregation, was a key civil rights meeting place. Some 200 church members were in the sanctuary or in the building that Sunday morning at 1022 when it filled with smoke. Most were able to evacuate the building, but at the end, the bodies of four young girls were found underneath the rubble in a basement restroom. Their names are on that next slide. Um, and what I would tell you is, three of them are the age of my sister, four of them were the age of my sister, and one was um, two and a half years my senior. Um, I, I was gonna turn 10 in November that year, so I remember this. This is my lifetime probably your lifetime for some of you. Our docent at the church, Rodney Gilliam, explained that this was the year before the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was signed into law, and black people were still suffering from the oppression of the Jim Crow era in which racial segregation was mandated in states like Alabama. Not true in the whole United States, but in Alabama and Mississippi, Louisiana, these were not separate but equal um, facilities. Um, with consistency, the facilities for African Americans were inferior and underfunded, and that includes medical care. Um, sometimes there were no facilities for black people at all. So this was also a time, you'll remember, when George Wallace was governor of Alabama, a leading foe of desegregation, and Birmingham had one of uh, the strongest and most violent chapters of the Ku Klux Klan. Police Commissioner Eugene Bull Connor was notorious for his willingness to use brutality in combating racial demonstration, union members, and just really any black citizens. The bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church was the third bombing in 11 days after a federal court order mandated the integration of Alabama schools. By 1963, homemade bombs were so routinely set off in Birmingham's black homes and churches, it had, named, it had earned the name Bombingham. Yeah. After we left the church, we went across the street to Kelly Ingram Park, where a local historian, Barry McNeely, met us, and he told us the stories of the protesters in the streets in the aftermath of the bombing. You'll remember the photographs of attack dogs and fire hoses. Remember those pictures unleashed on the protest protesters as they marched. 
while the white supremacists and the individuals that were immediately suspected in the bombing, justice went unanswered for more than a decade. And it was later revealed that the FBI had information concerning those perpetrators by 1965 and did nothing. In 1977, the case was reopened and Klan leader Robert Chambliss was convicted of murder, but it was not until 2001 and 2002, 39 years after this bombing, that two other suspects were convicted and a fourth person died before he was ever brought to trial. <coughs> so, day one. <laughs> um, that evening, one of our pilgrims, this is Therese, one of three Presbyterians on our trip. Therese and her husband Bernard are from Washington, D.C. Uh, she was moderator of her presbytery a while back, um, identifies as a contemplative. She's a spiritual director primary, primarily for people of color. So we're sitting around kind of debriefing, and Therese says, I, I need for you to understand that we're going to experience cognitive dissonance on this journey. You white people are gonna try to learn something. We are going to feel what our ancestors felt and to remember the people in our families who were lynched. And then Clara, this is Clara, our other leader. Clara, at great personal expense to herself, told her her story. She was a young college student in uh, Memphis in, um, I believe this was 1968, and she was protesting with others the uh, conditions of the sanitation workers, and Martin Luther King came, came back to Memphis. He was there for one a period of time, and then he came back to be with them. And so Clara and um, some of the people that marched that day were in the parking lot of the L Lorraine Hotel. And they were looking up at Martin Luther King while he was smiling down at them, talking to him about the catfish they were gonna have for supper when she heard the gun and she saw his body fly back and down. And she ran up to that balcony. She doesn't even, she said she doesn't remember doing it to his side where he lay, um, you know, in a pool of blood. And of course, for Clara, that was devastation unimaginable because this was who they pinned their hopes on. So Clara shared her story about what that felt like. And then she told us you know, I want you to, I didn't write this down, but I want you to Google James Lawson when you go home, because James Lawson was her pastor, and he was um, a powerful presence in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference to bring an understanding of what nonviolent resistance would look like. He had spent time in India, and um, a great guy, but he was her pastor. And following this assassination, James Lawson, because of who he was, began to visit James Earl Ray in prison. What we would all do, right? We'd go visit that guy in prison. We thought murdered someone. That's who James Lawson was. And he spent time with him over a period of years and came away from that um, with this story, and that was that James Earl Ray told Jim that somehow he got out of prison, and he got out of prison, and he had money and a car, and he was supposed to go to Memphis, and he was supposed to carry out this act. But by the time he got to Memphis, the police were everywhere, and, and Martin Luther King was already dead. So, you know, James Earl Ray believes he was set up and 
Jim and Clara believe that the FBI probably targeted Martin Luther King. Um, but again, you can Google James Lawson, a uh, great guy. So, you know, this is the end of day one, and I'm sitting there with these people, and um, what I realized was that it's really easy to intellectualize all of this information and stand back from it and not enter the pain. But when you're with someone like Clara or Therese, that just won't work, you know? You enter in. And so that night, I wrote in my journal um, that I was exhausted and overwhelmed. <laughs> and then the next day, we went to Selma. Um, okay, Selma, you know, it's about 50 miles from Selma to Montgomery. I learned that back in 1961, and this is, we're preceding the bonding time now, only 130 of the over 15,000 eligible black people in the Dallas County, the county of Selma, were registered to vote. 115 out of 15,000. And it was even worse in neighboring counties where roughly 80% of the population was black, but there were virtually no blacks on the voting polls. So then, you know, we go to Selma, we get to hear Joanne Bland. This is Joanne. She recounted the story of her mother's death. Um, Joanne was a little girl, her mother was pregnant, she was bleeding out, and they wouldn't give her white blood. So, they were waiting for black blood to come by bus, and her mother died while waiting for that transfusion. Ultimately, Joanne's grandmother, um, I believe from, I want to say Detroit, but from the north, uh, this is her maternal grandmother, came to raise Joanne and her siblings. Um, and because she had lived outside of the South, she knew that desegregation really was possible. And she began to go, go to meetings in Selma because folks were meeting. Folks were meeting. And her grandmother took Joanne and her sister and, and you know, what Joanne remembers is just playing around on the floor under under their feet while they were meeting and talking about all of this, but as Joanne says, you know, you left the meeting and you'd heard every word. You knew what was being taught, you understood. And uh, uh, so then ultimately what happens is children and students become at the forefront of the protests for voting rights. And this is, these foot soldiers, these foot soldiers, um, passed out voter registration forms, helped blacks prepare for literacy tests, picketed the courthouse over and over again in protest of unfair voting laws. They had less to lose than their parents did, right? Their parents had jobs, they were probably living on somebody's white, white people's property, but the kids could go. And then what, what happened was, you know, they got arrested. Right? Um, Joanne told us they had to rehearse what nonviolent resistance was. They had to practice. Because they'd been called those horrible names their whole lives, but they hadn't been beaten or spit on or any of those things. And so, you know, at this time, I think student, the student nonviolating, uh, student nonviolent coordinating committee, John Lewis, SNCC, they called him SNCC, um, came to Selma and began to, to teach these young people what nonviolent resistance would look like, and they practiced, they rehearsed. By the time Joanne was 11, she'd been arrested for protest 13 times, and in jail with 20 or so friends, housed in a cell, a cell meant for two people, you know, they'd just cram them in. Um, 
I don't think they kept them overnight very often because they didn't want to mess with them, but they would arrest them over and over and over again. Ultimately then, as you know, a march from Selma to the Capitol in Montgomery was planned for a, a formal protest against voter registration. John Lewis, SNCC, uh, and I think Andrew Young. Um, and on March 5th, 1965, Joanne and her sister were at the back of that line. And, you know, they looked out and saw across the bridge all of those police officers and the horses. And, you know, folks were terrified. They heard the pop, pop, pop of the tear gas canisters. And, you know, they were afraid those were guns. Um, about 600 people were there that day, I think. But what Joanne remembers is, you know, the horses rushing into the crowd and the officers with those billy clubs beating people and just running them down. She remembers hearing the lady uh, beside her, her head hitting the pavement. Her sister had to have 35 stitches in her head. Um, you know these stories, you've seen these pictures. Um, and you know that ultimately there was a march from Selma to Montgomery, um, but it happened only on the third try after Washington, D.C. intervened. So walking across that bridge, all I could feel was the courage of the people that had been there before me. Um, that bridge is named after a Klansman. He was a famous Klansman and U.S. Senator. I couldn't intellectualize this experience, you know. I felt it. The next day in Montgomery, our tour leader, Michelle Browder, an artist and activist, marched a single file. This is the Alabama River. She marched a single file up the path from the river along the path, along the way that enslaved black people walked, shackled to one another as they were herded up to the auction. Um, Michelle made us put, she made us march single file with our hand on the shoulder of the person in front of us, and this is what she said. You're gonna have to stay in step you're gonna to have to listen to one another, and you're gonna to have to move together. Well, that then became the metaphor of our trip, of our journey. We then went lots of places in Montgomery, I can't go into it. This is Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, that's Martin Luther King's first pastorate. And from the corner of that church, you can see uh, the Capitol building, uh, of Alabama, in front of which he made that speech at the end of the march. We also went to the Rosa Parks Museum, and, and I learned about the importance of the bus boycott. That was 1955. And she wasn't, you know, she wasn't just your average little seamstress, okay? This lady was secretary for the NAACP. We, they picked her for a reason to be the image of this, but this boycott, the Montgomery bus boycott, they're boycott, boycotting the treatment of blacks, right? Blacks had to, they got on the front of the bus and put their money in and then they had to walk around to the back door to get in and they could sit in the back seats only if a white person didn't come and say, I'm, I want that seat. And then they had to stand up and give that seat if a white person wanted it. And if it was too crowded, the black people just got put off the bus. That's what they were protesting. I've seen two numbers. It either lasted 328 days or 331 days. Martin Luther King was involved in the organization. Um, it was a phenomenally organized event. 40,000 black people, right, needed to ride the bus every day. Well, if they don't ride the bus, what happens to the bus system in Montgomery? It's crippled. Um, Huge organization effort. They met at night, 
you know, they'd work all day, they met at night, um, and, and this became kind of the example of what it took to change policy, um, but that it was possible. And by now, I hope you're seeing a theme. These were hardworking people. They had all the things to do that we have to do to occupy our time. They still had to cook, they still had to iron, they still had to do all that stuff, their personal stuff, on top of their jobs. But at night, they would go to the black churches and they would strategize and plan and organize in a phenomenal way. It, I, I can't imagine the energy and effort that went into all of that. I know I've never done that. Closest thing I've probably done, you know, was in college doing some big project or something with a group of people. I've never done anything like that. Maybe being an elder, maybe, right, in the church. Um, okay, so now, now we're gonna talk about the Equal Justice Initiative. This is the organization founded by Brian Stevenson. If you haven't read his book or seen the movie Just Mercy, just anything you can get your hands on by Brian Stevenson I think would be really worth your time and energy. I, I'm gonna do more. Um, Thursday was by far the most over, overwhelming day. We first visited the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. When the Equal Justice Initiative began planning for this um, memorial, they, they were interested not only in the lynching incidents themselves, but they were trying to understand what the terror of that sanctioned violence did to African American people in the United States. This six acre site sits atop a rise overlooking Montgomery. It memorializes the more than 4,400 African American men, women, and children who were hanged, burned alive, shot, drowned, or beaten to death by white mobs between 1877 and 1950. These were free black people who were accused of crimes, big crimes, some of them terrible, but they were, some of them were confused, uh, uh, accused of complaining about service in a white establishment. Some of them were uh, uh, accused of competing with a white business or of refusing to sell their goods at a cheaper than market price to a white person. Let's see the next slide. Samson Harris was lynched in Benville Parish, Louisiana after threatening to report white men for whipping his neighbors. Seven black people were lynched near Screamer, Alabama in 1888 for drinking from a white man's well. So certainly some of them were accused of serious crimes. None of these people got a trial by jury, right? None of them. They were victims of racial terror largely sanctioned by state and federal officials. Lynching in the American South were not isolated hate crimes by rogue vigilantes. Lynching was targeted racial violence. I, I have to quote this, it's too well said. Lynching was targeted racial violence at the core of a systematic campaign of terror perpetuated and furtherance of an unjust social order. Sometimes the hangings were announced ahead of time and they were turned into, you know, little spectacles, kind of like a Fourth of July picnic. And then, you know, people, crowds of people would almost celebrate. The, the memorial structure on the center of the site is constructed of over 800 steel monuments, one for each county in the United States where a documented lynching took place. The names of the victims are engraved on the columns if they're known. <clears throat> this error obviously left thousands dead, but it also marginalized black people in the country's political 
economic and social systems. It fueled a massive migration from the South by black people. They left the South by the thousands. I've read six million um, black folks left the South because of this. It inflicted deep traumatic and psychological wounds on survivors, witnesses, family members, and the entire African-American community. And what Diana said to me, and I've been talking to my friend Kathy about, is what, what happens to you inside of you when you suffer a horrible trauma and what changes then about what you pass on genetically to your children, to your grandchildren. Science knows a whole lot more about that now than they did then. But I think that's a real thing. As I walked the grounds of the memorial, I was stunned and dazed, and I really had a hard time just taking it all in. This is uh, memorializes how this artist believes black men feel about law enforcement, about police. See, some of their heads are even underwater. From there, uh, we moved to the Legacy Museum, which is also founded by the Equal Justice Initiative. And I'm just gonna read this to you. It's situated on a site in Montgomery where black people were forced to labor in bondage it's blocks from one of the most prominent slave auction spaces in America and steps away from the rail station where tens of thousands of black people were trafficked during the 19th century. It is an immersive experience that traces the history of black people in the United States from enslavement to the time of lynch lynching to the Jim Crow era and segregation, and then finally now to over-incarceration. And Brian Stevenson and the Equal Justice Initiative really believes that there's a link, right, from one of these to the other, that we're not done yet. Um, this museum is um, an immersive experience. I don't even remember whether I was allowed to take photographs I, you know, I was not in any shape to take photographs by then, I couldn't do it. And so, um, I can just tell you some of the things I learned. Um, I saw drawings of how enslaved people were treated as cargo on sailing ships, crouched over, unable to stand up, in some instances, I think, laying down and in and, and chains, chained to one another. Um, and, you know, they were, I don't know if they're even treated as well as animals were in the cargo of a ship. I don't, I don't know. I learned what the middle passage was. I never knew this. There's so much I didn't know. But the middle passage was um, a trade route. This is economics, right? You go from Europe with manufactured goods down to Western Africa. You exchange the manufactured goods for human beings. And then you transport the human beings across the Atlantic to the Americas, all of the Americas, in exchange for raw materials that then went back to Europe. You know, it was a trade route. Over 12 million people were taken against their will across the Atlantic Ocean during the Middle Passage. It's estimated that 2 million died en route because of the conditions. That, you know, so one wing of the museum is about enslavement, and then the next wing of the mu museum is about lynching and the lynching era and the stories from, the, from that era. And um, a lot of descendants from folks who are lynched have collected soil where they know their ancestor was hung. Um, lots of stories. And then the next... The next part of the museum is about the Jim Crow era, where you see all the signs that some of us remember. You know, what is colored water? You know, I want colored water. Um, I, ha I got to take 
a poll test to see if I could earn the right to vote. They had sample poll tests. They had questions on it like how many seeds in a watermelon, you know, things like that. Um, and then there are a lot of interviews and, and acting, you know, also enacted films um, to hear voices of people wrongly condemned, unfairly sentenced, and uh, unjustly treated in the American legal system. So, there was no way I could intellectualize this experience, right? I was doing good to just breathe. Um, but being there with a group of people who cared as much about the experience as I did was hugely beneficial. We sat together, we talked, um, we heard one another every day. Sometimes I was just too tired to deal with it. But the day after these museums on Friday, we went to a church, uh, an African-American church, and sat together and um, then tried to figure out what was ours to do. Um, and, and I'm sitting in a room with some people who've already done way more than their fair share, way more, to help change happen. And um, I just, you know, I, all I could do was know that I needed to tell you, I needed to tell people what happened, what I heard, the voices I heard, and then to look at you and say, will you help me figure out what's next? Thanks so much for listening, for coming, for being here. I appreciate it. I started reading, um, you know, right-wing news media like Fox and so forth to find out what the right-wing thinks and how could they possibly elect Trump. But one thing, they, they're always like justifying slavery. I read the comments on these pages. They say, well, the black people, you know, they captured all these slaves and brought them to the coast or what, wherever where this, the uh, ships came and picked them up. And um, I always say, well, who twisted the arms of the slave traders to make them pick up the slaves and t transport them to the Americas? Um, you know, who, who was responsible for that? There was a huge market and a huge economic system that um, enabled all this to happen. But I got very interested in black history, which growing up in Virginia, I was never taught because we only learned Virginia history and we learned that all the uh, founding fathers, especially those who were born in Virginia were like, we revered them, they were like gods. <clears throat> and that's all we ever learned. But um, I got interested in all this when the book, I grew up in Hampton, Virginia, when the book Hidden Figures came out because that's where I grew up. I read the book, the movie is partially fictionalized, but I knew all the names and my parents met at NAS. It was in ACA and my father spent his career there at Langley Field. And I knew all the names in the book. They were all friends and colleagues of my parents. And I've been, I've been doing a lot of writing since then. I am, it's taking me forever, but um, one of these days I'll finish it. <laughs> I think a lot of us didn't know. I mean, I, I, I um, said to Clara before we ever went on this trip, we had Zoom meetings before we went, and I said, you know, I was in a segregated school, but I didn't really understand what being in a segregated school meant. I didn't know. And she said, Julie, this is Clara, you know, who saw Martin Luther King assassinated. She said, we didn't know either. She said, our parents were protecting us just like your parents were protecting you. And I thought, of course they were, right? 
Of course they were protecting their children. Thank you again. Yeah, Joanne. Yeah, and it wasn't just the South. I grew up, I uh, went to grade school in Dearborn, Michigan. And I don't know at what point in my life I learned about this, but um, maybe it was after we moved away, but maybe it was when I was still a child, I don't know. Dearborn, you know, was the home of, Henry, of the Ford Corporation, and Henry Ford was a terrible man. Um, and Dearborn uh, was a sundown town. So at some point I learned that if anybody who was not white would try to move into Dearborn, they would be attacked and possibly killed. So. I, I forgot that I remembered this, but I used to teach in Virginia Beach, Virginia, and it was back in the 70s, and some of the teachers would gather before the kids would come into, in the cafeteria and have coffee, and we were sitting around with a group of very friendly people, and this one teacher, her name was Betty Malott, I still remember it now, because she said, these black children, you know, they just can't learn, and I was, horrified, and I don't think I went back for coffee again. It was shocking to me that that's what she thought. Doctors didn't think they felt pain either. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember SNCC. Um, Patty and I grew up in Van Nuys, California, and we went to a Presbyterian church there. And our college group was led by a couple that were from Mississippi. And they were really preaching to us when we would get together in those Sunday after church groups. And uh, several, uh, well, I think everybody in that group joined SNCC. I've got, still got my SNCC pin somewhere. <laughs> Several of them went to Mississippi and some of the places to demonstrate. Um, I did not go, and I kind of always felt guilty that I didn't go, but, you know, I was going to college and wanted to continue my college education. That was more important to me at the time. But um, I don't know if anyone else is of that age, but that, that was quite a, quite a time of what was going on. And so in, in the LA area, we were all learning about what was going on. You know, we knew what was going on, believe me. Thanks, Vic. This last Monday evening, Dave and I watched the film Selma, and I had deliberately chose it because I knew this lecture was coming and Julie was gonna share with us at the, uh, it's a DVD I rented from Netflix, and at the, um, there's several chapters besides the film, educational materials, lots of things that pose tons of questions. So if you wanna learn more, um, so I did all that before I watched the film, and I'm really glad I did. There was um, things that, like you said, it was a little cerebral until you feel like you're immersed into it. And as the film started, well acted, beautiful people portraying horrific things. And I was just absorbed, like you say, on your tour, you couldn't even you know, bring your phone up to take a picture. Watching the film, I just felt numb, um, knowing that this is still active in our culture today. The mindset is there, and the behaviors are there, and the dis disadvantages are there. It's a great film, and I have the other one on order that you mentioned as well. Um, it, I can't let go of it, it's important. Um, yeah, Joanne was talking about Dearborn. I just wanted to remind everybody that Oregon was um, founded to be an all-white state, and that's why we, we have a lower population of black people than other states today. 
I grew up in Wichita, Kansas, and I was born in 1952, for those of you who can do the math. Um, and my parents discussed these things every single day. These things were in the news all the time. My father was director of development at uh, Fringe University, which is a Quaker college. But he also, for two years, was a pastor at a church that we helped start that was an integrated church in Wichita. And so these things were always very, very real to all of us. Sometimes I'm astounded by my ignorance. I grew up in Southern California, born in 1947, if you can do the math. And um, I remember being barely aware of when Ruby went to an all-white school. And I, it was kind of something you heard about, but it wasn't overemphasized. And I think, how sheltered were we? And I do remember that we had one black family move into our neighborhood and um, the people wanted to welcome them, but they didn't want to do it in a ridiculous way because they were blocks away. So it wouldn't be a typical person you would go welcome. And they said, if I, my mom wanted to take cookies or something, and she said, but if I go over there, I'm saying, I'm only coming over here because you live blocks away and you're black. And she didn't, she was conflicted about how to do that. But they were in our neighborhood for probably a couple of years and then they moved and I always wondered why. I just wanna say thanks, Julie, for sharing this with us. Um, although it, it has a historical aspect to it, it certainly is relevant to what is happening today. Uh, with discussions about critical race theory and people who are not only want to sweep it under the rug, they want to throw it in a black hole. Um, and I spent a few years with the uh, Department of Justice working on civil rights cases because fortunately I was there during a time when the administration was encouraging that. But. I also would like people to know that civil rights goes away from that department every time a certain political party is in power and there is no support of civil rights. Very minimal, very minimal. So um, in our own neighborhood, we have people wanting to ban books and uh, I just think it's something we all critically need to be aware of right now. And I thank you for bringing it to us. Let's, let's think about what we shall do next. Not just thoughts and prayers. <laughs> what do we do next?